Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm gonna show you how to replace an alternator in your car. This is a relatively easy job to do depending on the location of your alternator. Today I'm working on my car and guess what? My battery light stays on after I start the engine. Now there are a few common reasons for the battery light to come on, so I'm gonna show you how to diagnose and make sure it is your alternator. Now you may have a different car, but the alternator replacing procedure is basically the same in any car. So let's get started. The battery in your car is the main power source for your car's electrics and as you drive the car, the battery is being used so it needs recharging. That job is done by the alternator. Alternator's main duty is to maintain the charge of your car's battery. If your battery is not getting enough charge, it will turn on the battery light. Every time you start your car, you will see the battery light comes on along with all the other dashboard warning lights, telling you that the battery is not charging. This is normal because you haven't started the engine yet, the alternator is not spinning, so it's not charging the battery. After you start the car, the battery light is supposed to go off as now the engine is spinning and the alternator is also spinning and providing the charge to the battery. If the light didn't go off in few seconds, that means you have some sort of charging issue and you want to fix it right away. Because driving a car with the battery light on is like driving a car with a low fuel light on. Soon it's gonna run out of juice and you'll be stranded on the road. Now, there are a few common reasons other than the alternator that could trip the battery light on. You may have loose or corroded battery cables. Your drive belt that runs the alternator could be too loose. You may have a bad battery that can't hold the charge anymore. It could be a bad voltage regulator. Or sometimes it could be something as simple as a blown fuse or a relay. Or if you have a modern car that has a computer control alternator, then it could be a bad connection between the alternator and the car's computer. So you want to check them all before you even replace an expensive alternator. So the first thing you want to do is to open the hood and locate the alternator and the battery. Most modern cars come with plastic covers installed over the engine compartment these days, which is good for looks and aerodynamic efficiency. But when you want to do some maintenance on the car, they become really annoying. Now these plastic covers are held together by these little panel clips. You want to get a little steel pick like this, pick under the head and pull, and the clip will pop right off. If you have a panel popper, you can use that. After removing all the clips, the cover will come right out. Then you want to take off the engine cover as well. First thing you want to do is to check the battery voltage. You can easily do this with the basic multimeter. Red lead goes to the positive battery terminal and the black lead goes to the negative battery terminal. Dial the selector knob into 20 DC volts and connect to the terminals. Give it a little scratch to get a good contact. If you are getting about 12.6 volts, then your battery is charged. If you are getting below 12.4 volts, then your battery needs recharging. Right now, I'm only having 12.10 volts, which is very low. Testing the voltage is not enough to see if the battery is good. You also want to load test the battery to see if the battery has the desired coil cranking amps. You can easily do this with a load tester like this. They are very inexpensive and it is a good thing to have. This battery is only a few months old, so I know for sure that this battery is good. Then you want to start the car and check the voltage again. Now the engine is running and the battery is being charged. So it should be between 14.2 volts and 40.7 volts for many cars. For my car, it should be around 13.5 volts. Right now, I'm only getting 11.63 volts, which is even lower than what the battery already had. So I'm not getting a good charge at all. This doesn't mean your alternator is bad. It could be the connection between the battery and the alternator. You want to check for any loose connections and corroded wires. You also want to check the cables for the resistance. When the cables get older, the internal properties might change and may develop high resistance. So it is possible to have a significant voltage drop from one end to the other end. If you found any bad wire circuit connections, you want to replace them right away. And it may solve the problem. I've already checked all the cables that connect the battery and the alternator. They are in good shape. No corrosion or excessive resistance on the wires. I'll have two separate videos on how to test an alternator and how to test a car battery. And I'll put the links to those videos in the description down below. Next thing you want to check is the fuses and relays. In this car, the fuse box is located right next to the battery. Look what we got here. This could be the problem. I wonder how this guy get there. Go to your fuse box and locate the fuse for the alternator. In my car, the fuse for the alternator is one massive fuse. I don't even need to take it out to see if it's burned. The metal inside the fuse is continuous, so the fuse is okay. Have a good visual inspection of all relevant fuses because sometimes one burn fuse for another electrical system may cause the alternator circuit to not work properly. 
Some cats may have more than one fuse box. I happen to have a second fuse box under the dashboard. So have a good visual inspection of all relevant fuses. The last test I want to show you guys is the alternator voltage test. This has to be done while the engine is running. Like the battery, alternators also have a positive and negative terminals. Positive one is the B post, feeds the power directly into the battery. Negative terminal is the alternator housing. It is grounded to the car's chassis. Get to your multimeter again, connect the red lead into the B post and the black lead onto the alternator housing. Check the voltage. It should be around 13.5 volts for my car when the engine is idling. But I'm only getting 10.9 volts. In my case, I also have one of my friend's cars which has the same engine and the alternator. So just for double checking, I tested the alternator voltage on that car and look what I got. Exactly 13.5 volts. That means my alternator is definitely bad and I need to replace it. Now that is how you properly diagnose a bad alternator. Now in some cars, like this 2004 Mitsubishi Lancer, the alternator is really easy to get to. You just have to undo the two bolts that hold it in place, unplug the electrical connections, loosen the tensioner pulley, slip the belt off and take off the alternator. But in my car, it is much more involved. And by the time I started working on it, it was almost midnight. But that wouldn't stop me from doing this job, so let's get started. I'm gonna jack up the car and put it on jack stand. As I'm about to start working on engine bay, Getting the car to a decent height will allow me to work standing next to the engine bay for a long time, which is good rather than having to bend over the engine bay when the car is sitting too low to the ground, so I wouldn't have a bad back after finishing the job. The best thing to have when you're working on a car is good working room, and that is exactly what I don't have here. Everything is so packed up, so you need to take a lot of parts out before you get to the part that you really want to take off. First thing you want to do is to disconnect the negative battery terminal, so you wouldn't short out anything while you're working on the car. Because my battery is pretty low on voltage, I'm gonna take it out and connect to the charger. First, we have to remove the coolant hose. So place a drain pan under the car to catch any fluid that might leak. Take a pair of long noise pliers and loosen up the hose clamp and slide it off to a side. The coolant pipe seems to be welded so tight to the metal and it doesn't wanna come off at all. Biggest problem here is there's only very limited space to work, so I can't pull it hard. I try to pull it out with an anchoring rope, but that didn't work either. So I decided to get my trusty heat gun and heat up the rubber for a few seconds. Whenever you use a heat gun, always keep the nozzle moving at a safe distance from the object. The idea is not to let excessive heat build up in one spot. There comes the coolant hose out. Then you want to slip the belt off from the alternator. This is where the serpentine belt removal tool comes in handy. It is a long tool so you can put plenty of leverage to turn the tension and pulley. If you have an extra long wrench with a matching head size, you can use that without having to go under the car. Because I don't have either of those tools, I'm gonna use a regular size 14 wrench to push the pulley against the tensioner spring from up under the car. Then the belt will become loose so we can slip the belt off the pulley. On the tensioner pulley, there's a little hole and when you push the pulley, it matches up with another hole in the housing behind it. So you can insert something like an allen key to lock it in place. I just left the wrench wedged up against the chassis, which works just fine. Then you will remove all the electrical connections. There's one right here. This one is the positive terminal of the alternator. And there's the second one. Good. Then you will remove all the bolts that hold the alternator in place. There's one right on the top. That's one bolt. There's two bolts behind the alternator, which you can't see at all. So get your phone and take a photo. This one is way too recessed, so I'm gonna use an extension to get it off. There it comes. To get to the third bolt, which is right underneath the alternator, we have to take this coolant pipe off. So we have to remove two 10mm bolts that hold the pipe in place. And when I try to get it out, guess what? I can take it out as one end of the piping keeps banging onto the idle pulley. It is really cramped up space here. In fact, it was too cramped. My tools can't even reach the bolts. So I had to jack up the engine a bit higher to make some room for the tools. After removing the idle pulley and the pipe, 
Now we can see the alternator and the hidden bolts located right underneath it. So let's take it up real quick. Now it is time to take the alternator out. After wiggling it back and forth and there it comes. Even though we broke the alternator loose, there's no room to take it off. So we have to take off front A intake and the radiator fan assembly out of the way. Now we have enough room to take the alternator out and there it comes. Now we have to find out what's wrong with it. I can already see the problem but it is almost 2 o'clock in the morning now so I'm going to do it later in the daylight. Alright it is daytime and he's the bad boy which causes all this trouble. As you can hear there's some creaking noise coming from the alternator as I'm rotating the axle. This is a common symptom in modern alternators telling you that you have a bad decoupler pulley. In older cars, alternators had a solid pulley that runs off of a belt, but in modern cars, the alternator comes with something called a decoupler pulley, which acts as a little clutch to help protect both battery and the alternator from overrunning and thereby overcharging. A failing decoupler pulley has a common symptom of making a worn bearing noise for a few seconds after you turn off the engine. And guess what, I was having the same symptom a few weeks prior to the total failure of the pulley I'm having right now. This is an easy fix, we just have to replace the decoupler pulley, but I'll get to that later. Even though we've already figured out the problem, you always want to check all the components because sometimes it could be more than one component that failed. More importantly, it will give you some evidence of the cause for the alternator to go bad in the first place. For example, let's say you installed some heavy duty fog lights on your car. Now there's extra demand on the battery when the lights are working. So the battery drains out faster and to maintain the battery's charge, the alternator also has to work hard. In most cases, the stock alternator is not designed for this extra demand, so too much electricity flowing through the voltage regulator and the rectifier inside the alternator will overheat those parts and they will burn out quickly. And also, higher the electricity an alternator has to make, harder it becomes to spin. That is no big deal for an old alternator with a fixed pulley, but bad news for an alternator with a decoupler pulley. Because the decoupler pulley acts as a little clutch and the alternator being harder to spin means the clutch will wear out faster. So it is important to find the reason for the alternator to go bad, otherwise the replacement unit will also burn out quickly. You also want to check for any coolant or oil leaks that might drop fluid onto the alternator, which is also a very common reason for an alternator to go bad. In most cases, it is either the voltage regulator or the rectifier inside the alternator that goes bad, which you can easily test with a simple multimeter. Dial the multimeter to your diode test mark and start measuring the resistance. Different alternators use different components inside which have different specs for the conductivity and resistance. So you know match up the model number of your alternator which lives on a sticker on the alternator housing and get the specs for the component you're testing. Downloading the service manual for your engine is the easiest method to do this. The engine in my car is a 3.5 liter V6 engine with a 2GR-FE code name. This is the same engine you'll find in any Toyota or Lexus with a 3.5 liter V6 engine. And here I've got the service manual for the charging system and it has all the information you'll ever need. Circuit diagrams, torque figures for every single bolt, specs for every single component in your alternator. All you have to do is to get a multimeter and test. If you find something faulty, then you can replace the part for a fraction of the cost of a new alternator. You can buy these parts from spare parts stores or from online shops. Now, I've already tested mine and they're all within the specs, so mainly the decoupler pulley causes the problem here. Now, in my case, I do a lot of driving in heavy stop and go traffic, so it is pretty normal for the decoupler pulley to go bad after 230,000 kilometers. Because this alternator has high mileage, some other components inside might also be on their way out, so it is a good idea to replace the entire alternator. So, I contacted the local Toyota service center and asked the price for a brand new alternator. So then I tried some local junkyards and they were all asking around 400. Buying from online shops like Amazon or eBay is cheaper but the shipping is expensive to where I'm living and what I'm getting is a remanufactured alternator. After a few more lookups, I found a local guy who is selling his car for parts due to a front end accident and I was able to buy a low mileage alternator for just $200. 
I have already tested this and this is in good working condition. So let's begin the installation. You want to slide the alternator back into its position in the same way you took it out. The top tip here is to clean the contact points on the bracket where the ball goes on because this is where the alternator meets the ground connection to the car. So you want to have a good clean connection. You can use a wire brush or a sandpaper for this. Then put the bottom ball back on and the rest of the balls. Now it's time to plug the electrical connections back on. Make sure you use some dielectric grease or some silicon paste on the connections. This will prevent the connections from corroding and having weak connections in the future. And don't forget to put the rubber boot over the B post. Then we have to install the fan assembly and the electrical connections for that. Connect all the radiator hoses back on and add some coolant. Now it is time to install the battery. Because we left the battery to charge overnight, it is fully charged now. You always want to have the battery fully charged whenever you install a brand new alternator. Otherwise, once you start the car, the alternator will have to work hard to charge the battery if you start off with a big battery. And that is not good. When you install the battery, make sure to clean the terminals with a wire brush and rub some silicon paste. This will give you a good connection that lasts a long time. Before we install the rest of the plastic covers back on, let's go start the car to see if we have fixed the battery light. Alright, here comes the moment of truth. Alright, this baby started in one shot and no more battery light. Look at that. Okay, no more battery light. Now that's how you properly diagnose and replace an alternator in your car. Now we can install the rest of the plastic covers back on. Just to sum up this video, I want to show you guys some comments from other people who get the same job done at a dealership spending more than a thousand dollars. But I only paid $200 and I can even repair the old one and sell it to a junkyard so I can actually make some money from this. Thanks for checking out this video and remember I post new videos every week so if you want to learn more do it yourself videos like this, be sure to subscribe to the Junky DIY Guy channel. I'll see you in the next one. Right now I'm editing this video and I just got this pencil from delivery. So apparently this is the serpentine belt removal tool I ordered online so it came up after the repair. That's bad news and good news.